every week we used to go to um, a local cinema, and there was a newsreel called Associate British Pathé, and the opening shot was a man standing on a camera car with a Mitchell camera on a tripod. And it was this image that sort of captured me somehow. I don't know why. And I thought, I'd like to be that man looking through that camera. <laughs> and after that, I started to take an interest in every film I went to see. I started to take an interest in the photography and how the film was made. I thought I would like to be that person. And where that comes from, I have no idea. It just came out of the blue, and uh, and I followed it. What were th- what were the earliest uh, movies and 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 photographers that that really caught your eye? Well, they were like uh, I wasn't very sophisticated about photography then. I mean, I'm talking about being uh, uh, eleven or twelve, um, so I didn't understand how photography actually took place. All I knew was there was a camera and a man looking through it and pointing it, and that sort of uh, captured me, first of all. Um, I saw a lot of films, many, many, many films, uh, all of the period. I'm, one film stuck out in my mind was Scaramouche, an MGM film with uh, Stuart Granger, which was in Three Strip Technicolor. Um, and just a lot of films like that, um, uh, of that period, Westerns and stuff. I mean, I, titles would be difficult. I mean, there's no one title I would say that, that I said, that's the photography I want to do. That came much, much later in, uh, in my life. This might be kind of an odd question and a, a little bit off on a tangent, but, I mean, you had mentioned, obviously, when you started out and for, for a good part of your career – uh, we didn't have immediate access to review a particular scene or a film on a whim. Uh, it had to kind of exist in our minds. Do you think the availability of you know essentially anything you want to see and review for reference, having that right there at the ready in a second's notice, is that helpful for the art of cinematography or, or a, a detriment? Uh, no, I think it's, very, it's helpful for people that are interested in cinema. You know, I have a very close friend who um, learned about cinema because he had a, uh, an older, uh, an acquaintance who had a collection of uh, DVD, uh, VHS tapes. Of a movie. And, and this kid is, um, I mean, he's a lot younger than me. He's like 30, 35 or something. And he said that he, he knew this guy had all these VHS tapes and he started to borrow them. And uh, and this guy was had like a cross section of films from uh, every country and every era, silent and uh, so on, and that introduced him to cinema and that that got him interested in it. It was just seeing all these different types of films. So I think it is very useful to people now. But in my day, uh, I mean, the first video recorder, uh, I was already shooting feature films by the time the first video recorder came around. So by then you just had to have memories and you had photographic books, of course. You had things like painting you could refer to in terms of light and composition and things like that. Um, but it was, as you said, it was just memory, memory, remembering movies. And, and it's only now that you can go back and um, thank God you can actually go back and relive some of those movies and re- refresh your memory and say, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's interesting how you very often you get your mind plays tricks on you and you remember a shot and how it goes and then when you actually get to see it, it's not like that at all. It's actually slightly different. But it's still a shot that, that, that sticks in your mind. Uh, you know, like, I mean, Citizen Kane, all that stuff. Um, I was with a group of guys and we used to rent 16mm prints of movies uh, and show them in our uh, one of our guys' houses. He had a bedroom, he had a spare bedroom and he converted it into a little home cinema And uh, I worked, uh, my first job ever was as a clerk with uh, MGM sales distribution in London. And uh, we used to rent films from MGM, 60 mil. And we bought a 60 mil projector and we used to project these on the wall. Um, And we used to do that where where other kids were out playing football on Saturday afternoons. We were sitting behind closed curtains watching all these movies. And from those, uh, you know, the, the, the mainstream, the MGM type of film, uh, we learned that other distributors had foreign films and other sorts of films, and so we broadened our interest. Um, so, and I'm so I'm going back to 1957, 1958. So, uh, you know, that you could get 60 millimeter prints of films, even though you, there were no such things as VHS or DVD or any of those sorts of things. So, there were ways of you know looking at them again, and also there were repertory cinemas. 
Uh, there was the British Film Institute, for instance, which was built in 1951, and uh, that used to have a lot of res- retrospectives of directors, and I was a member of that for many years. Um, so you could actually, you know, it, it, it's not relatively new. It's new that it's instantly available, but it was available. You just had to look for it. And you used to get the program from the National Film Theatre and uh, see what films were in there. And there were maybe films that you've always wanted to see or films you wanted to see again. So you could actually, you know, re- re- go back to these films. Well, you talk about projecting 16 millimeter prints in the repertory houses. That was a period of time. Uh, I mean, the, the late 50s on into the 60s and the French New Wave and the tremendous influence that that had. That was a period of time where there was a, a very rich film culture i mean people really engaged in the films and oh, yeah. they were challenged yeah. by them where yeah. do you see that film culture today well uh i just don't think uh, well it's interesting that i think every country still makes a film uh, that makes at least one film uh, that's what's fascinating to me um many years i've attended the uh camera image film festival in the for the art of cinematography in poland and I've been fortunate enough to sit on the juries there for you know, three or four years. Um, you know, I've been through every single jury there is. And what you get to see is that everybody's making, you know, every country's making films, the Lebanese, the Armenians, the uh, Arabs, the, everybody's making a film. Uh, they may not make a lot of them, and they may not make a lot of money, and they may not be very expensive to make, but they are making films. So it's interesting that this the culture of filmmaking and film viewing uh, keeps on going and keeps surviving. Um, when I was uh, in the 60s, as you said, late 60s, my, you know, I was a very young man then, there were seven cinemas, I remember, in the centre of London who showed nothing but foreign films. The tragedy is that that's now gone, and it's now multiplexes who tend yeah. to go for the film that they think is going to make the most money, which is almost inevitably a, a franchise film from Hollywood. That's the tragedy of it all. And so now you have to look further afield to get uh, interesting stuff and foreign stuff um, but you now that's coming around with uh, you know websites and Netflix and all those people that the, the, the availability is there. But when I go to Camera Image, as I was there last November, there are still films that I see there that I think are really good. And I say to people, friends of mine, I said, look, the chances are you'll never see this film because uh, you know there's no reason for an American distributor to buy it or a Western distributor to buy it. That's the tragedy of cinema. There's so many people who want to make films, can make films, and do make really good films. But the distribution side of it is uh, not as good as it was. It's, um, it's now, you know, it's survival of the fittest. Survival of the most money-making film, I think. Yeah, I absolutely Did agree. Did that answer your I mean, question? But, uh, it absolutely does. But I, I guess the one godsend is that uh, it is possible to find your own way to self-distribute now. Uh, but it, that that as well is kind of a uh, yeah. A but crash, you can self distribute. Yeah, yeah. But you can self distribute. But can you make any money out of it? And you know, right. making any film costs money. You know, and this this friend of mine I was talking about earlier who got sucked into the film, you know, through watching all these VHS. Uh, he just you know produced a feature film, a little horror film. You know, and it's the budget was very low. It was under a million pounds, British pounds. Um, but even so, you know, trying to get that ma- that small amount of money back is is so difficult. Um, and all these platforms, you've got streaming and YouTube and Vimeo and all those things, but there's no revenue comes out of it. So films yeah. are still available to see, but if we don't finance the making of films, films will stop being, you know, will, will gradually not be made, and that's the tragedy of it all. Yeah. Um, Hollywood survives because it's a business, and it survives as a business model. You have guys coming into Hollywood now who were trained in business management at Harvard University, and uh, they're not filmmakers anymore. They're they're about making uh, a buck or two. So they look at your project, and uh, they say whether or not they think it's worth them putting money in, whether they think they're going to get their money back, not whether they think it's a good film worth making. And that, I think, we're... That's, I think, that what's happened in recent years is this move away from the, if you like, the the uh, the art and desire to make a decent film into how much money can we make and how do we sell it, and that well, I think is uh, skewing the, uh, the the output. You know. 
Well, we, we've we've ha- we've definitely had conversations, <clears throat> excuse me, on a regular basis about this very dilemma, and it, it sounds very um, negative and apocalyptic. But do, do you see it as a cyclical thing? Do you think that we'll get past this stage and, and enjoy it? No, because people are not going to go back to the cinema. The cinema, you know, every year the cinema attendances go down. Uh, they, they make more. They seem to make uh, the same amount of money, if not more. But they make that very often from the uh, the hike in prices, like 3D now that adds five dollars to every ticket price. So they make more money from doing that. That's why they like the idea of 3D. Um, but you know, kids like 3D. So and a kids film makes you more money because the whole family goes. Whereas you know when I was 18, 19 years old, I went on my own just to see these films. Um, and therefore I was one ticket. Now, if you can get the whole family to get out of their houses and stop watching TV and go to the cinema, you're going to make a lot more money. But getting them to do that is is hard. And um, uh, I, I can see cinema dying out as a, as a, as a cultural um, uh, event. Uh, I mean, I love being in a cinema with a load of people, watch, particularly watching comedy and uh, stuff like that. It's great fun, you know, to hear the audience thinking the same way as you and enjoying the film the same way as you are. But so many people, I mean, you've got geeks. I mean, if you're geeks, forgive me for saying, you've got, um, <laughs> you know, you you find out that, uh, you know, films are downloaded, you know, as a pirated download, like millions and millions of copies of films are pirated and downloaded, which means it's not, and I'm not talking about the pirating part of it, which is bad enough, but the bad part is that they're watching them on the computer. They're not actually watching them in the cinema. They're downloading it and sitting at home and watching it on a desk with headphones on or maybe. And I don't think that's the way to watch cinema. What is interesting to me is that I've, you know, I have a huge collection of uh, DVDs of classic films. I have about a thousand of them, if not more. Uh, and I also have a huge collection of Academy screeners, which I get every year as being a member of the Academy. Um, I destroy the ones I don't think are worth keeping, but occasionally I keep ones. So I've got a huge collection of these things. And very often I'll go to the cinema and there was a documentary recently uh, about Roger Ebert called uh, Life Itself. And uh, there have been other documentaries which have film clips in them. And suddenly you see this clip from a film you know very well from a DVD, but now you're seeing it 60 feet wide. And it's a different experience. And that's what those films were made for. And now everybody makes it. I mean, they make it for the iPhone, it seems to me. Every film has a close-up of a head. You know, 50% of the screen time is a close-up of a head. And you look at films like Lawrence of Arabia, which were shot, you know, camera uh, MGM 70, Super 70, which was a partial anamorphic um, squeeze on a 65 millimeter negative. These films are meant to be shown on big screens. Therefore, the imagery in them, you know, can be really quite small. There's a shot in um, Lawrence Arabia where he goes off to pick up the man who's fallen off his camel, if you remember. Yes. And uh, Lawrence goes back to pick him up. And the boys, one of the boys that's been following him around, his sort of little servants, um, goes to wait for him at the edge of the camp. And he's sitting there. And at one point, he, he for some reason, he, he lifts his head up and he looks. And the camera cuts to his POV. Now, everywhere you see this POV, there's nothing there except the desert. But when you see it as a 70 mil print in the cinema, there is a small dot, which is Lawrence coming back, which uh, excites the boy, and he starts to, to gallop towards Lawrence. Now, most people don't know what that shot is because they see it too small. You know, and they, it's probably the dot is probably pixelated. So by the time they get the dot, they don't know what that dot is. Um, and those films were made for really big screen uh, enjoyment. And we, we're missing that now, you know, I think. And it's all about crash, bang, wallop. You know, it's uh, how the bigger explosion, the cars. I mean, every film now has a car going up into the air, turning over two or three times and crashing down in a ball of fire. Um, it's, and that gets all the kids in to see films. Uh, you make an intelligent film, um, and you don't get that sort of audience. So if you make an intelligent film, you've got to make it very, very cheaply, which means you can't use all the tools at your uh, disposal because you can't afford them, um, like CGI and the camera cranes, steady cams, uh, multiple cameras, all those things. 
you can't actually afford them on a smaller budget picture. And, and uh, I'm going off track here, but what I think is going to happen is that pe- it's people are going to dial in at home, Netflix, Amazon, uh, Hulu, whatever it's called, that one. Um, you know, they're going to dial in and get a huge TV at home, a 55-inch TV, and start watching films that way because it means they save, they don't have to get the car out of the garage, get into the car, drive to the local town, park the car, pay $10 to park the car. Then they've got to go and have some food or afterwards or before. So that's a $45 tag. And then they're going to go into cinema, which is $12 a ticket. And, you know, it's, uh, if you've got a family of two, it's a lot of money. So to get them out I, there and get them in that cinema, it's got to be a remarkable film. I agree. It, go ahead. It, and the, there, there are those economic considerations, but also I think it speaks to something larger in the culture in that we have all of this technology now that theoretically should make us feel more connected to each other than ever, but, but it's made us more isolated. And, and I think what you're yeah. talking about is the activity of going out to the movies and rubbing shoulders with others and having that shared yeah. experience. That's really what's yeah. di- dying off, yeah. Yeah, um, and that's been, that's been propagated by television. You know, because you go to a cinema now and people talk in the middle of the movie because that's what they do at home. And, uh, you know, and somebody comes on the screen and at home they go, oh, wasn't that guy in, uh, wasn't that, guy in that film years ago? Blah, blah, and they now do that in the cinema. Whereas when I went to the cinema, the audience was dead quiet and we just stared at the screen for the whole movie. Um, and I think certainly I'm one of those people who now find it difficult to go to a, a, a mainstream cinema. I choose my cinemas very carefully. I'm fortunate I get asked to see a lot of preview screenings, so I don't have to go through that. And I sit many, very often with uh, um, uh, industry people. So we don't get that sort of behavior. But, you know, I mean, look at the credits now. As soon as the film ends, everyone's out of their seat and out of the cinema, you know, and I'm usually the last one in there watching to see who actually made the film. Um, it's 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 different now. It's just different. And well, in, you know, when I when my parents were young, you know, the cinema was all there was. You know, that's where you went to to uh, you, you took a girl out, you took her to the cinema, and uh, you know, if it was a scary film, she might hang on to you, and that was like, like you know, encouraging. If it was a romantic film, you know, she'd be fluttering her handkerchief, and you could console her, and all of that sort of thing. That seems to me to be a thing of the past now. Yeah, it's all it's all well, about it's, and video games. Every video game is about killing people. So now, uh, you know, these kids are so involved in those video games is that they want a film that looks like the video game, and they're making films that look like the video game. And 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 from and an economic stand from an economic standpoint, it uh, it's impossible for a film to gross as much as a popular video game. I mean that that industry exactly. is yeah, but but in ter- in light of all of this kind of disheartening news. <laughs> are 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 you still uh, turned on by film for the same reasons that you were when you first started? Absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, uh, what I'm saying is that people like me are rare now. Um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, most of your neighbours would have seen the same film as when I was a young man. Most of your neighbours would have seen the same film you saw. Most of the people you worked with would have said, you know, uh, I want to go and see that film. Was it any good? Did you see it yet? You don't get that so much now, I don't think. You do maybe amongst the young, but you don't get that much. You know, once people have kids, they sort of fall out of that syndrome. You know, they're now firmly ensconced in front of the TV. That's what I think is changing. And, of course, you know, cinemas have had to knuckle down to making their films available on those platforms, um, uh, you know, which is sad in a way. But they're, they're, change, they're chasing the dollar. So, in a sense, uh, they've got to keep going and they've got to fund their business. Yeah. Well, I, I want to get back to your career uh, specifically. Yeah. Now, you uh, you kind of cut your teeth at, at the BBC, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I wanted to know what that training, what that did, what that did for you. What were the most valuable lessons you learned from that time? Well, the most valuable thing was the training. I mean, I mean, unbelievable. Um, when I left school, there was no such thing as film schools. Um, uh, there may have been some somewhere, maybe in Poland and places like that, but there was certainly none in London, to my knowledge. Um, I'm talking about 1950. Seven now, and so I didn't know how I could get in the business. I just knew I wanted the job, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. 
and uh, I had a number of peripheral jobs. One, the first one was the clerk working for MGM sales department, which was just pen pushing. Um, and they, they more or less made it categorically clear that I would never go. There's no other part of MGM that I could access from that office, um, although there was a studio in Elstree. But very shortly, they closed down the sales office after I left it, and they have actually closed down the MGM studio. So, you know, they wouldn't have helped. But then I, I got a job as a projectionist in an in a advertising agency who were making TV commercials and a librarian. And uh, we had a slight flurry of thing where me and my friends, we tried to make our own low-budget feature film because we'd seen John Cassavetti's Shadows which was made on 16 mil for uh, Peanuts. And it was showing at um, a cinema in Oxford Street, which is no longer with us, um, one of those uh, foreign film centers I, you know, I was talking to you about. Um, and we thought we could do something equally as good. I mean, it was naive of us, completely naive. So, uh, but, but we thought we could, and that all fell apart. And then a friend of mine, girlfriend of mine, was working as an usherette, and uh, in a cinema, and she said, um, did you uh, read the Sunday Times at the weekend? They were advertising for a trainee assistant film cameraman at the BBC. Uh, and I had not even thought of that, and uh, of BBC television. So I didn't think they did film. I thought they only did like live TV. And so I went, so I made an application. They said that uh, the training scheme was full, um, but they'd be happy to take me on as a projectionist because they were short of staff. And while I was there, I might be in a position to take on the training ship. And uh, I did. And uh, what they then, they had a little uh, proper schoolroom set up where you, um, they taught you about sprockets and uh, camera speeds, 25, 4 frames per second, or 25 as it was for TV. They taught you all about the sort of difference between 16 mil and 35 cameras, lacing up cameras, all that sort of thing. So I was in the thick of it now. And then they put you out on the road as a supernumerary. And uh, you're allowed to just help carry the boxes. And then eventually, uh, depending on your your head cameraman, you could uh, clap the board and make notes of the footages. And um, so gradually, bit by, I then started to see how films were really properly made, which I'd never seen before. I'd only watched documentaries and read books. But here I was actually doing it. And that was tremendously helpful. And the yeah. thing about the BBC was they produced the television film unit, as it's known, produced 33 hours of television a week. So uh, it meant everybody was working all the time. And there was never a time when they would say, well, we don't need you for a month. You know, it was just like on Friday they'd say, you've done that. Now on Monday I want you to go with so-and-so who's doing this job here, here, and here. And so you were constantly working, working often with different cameramen on different projects, doing different types of work. Um, so it was in, intensely uh, useful from that point of view. And then I gradually worked my way through, and they had a system where if a cameraman went on holiday, they tried not to hire in freelance cameramen because they knew they would be expensive. So what they had a habit of doing was promoting more experienced assistants to be cameramen for the period of summer, uh, usually on documentary work, very low key work, not not studio lighting or anything you know, serious. Um, well, it was serious, but you know what I mean. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I got promoted to a documentary series called Man Alive, which was um, a sort of tabloid journalist uh, one-hour show. And um, so I spent, you know, two or three years with the camera firmly attached to my shoulder, handheld, uh, learned how to work without an exposure meter, learned how to build in cutting points for the editor, because it was all very well pointing at someone making a speech, but he then had to give the editor something that he could cut to if he wanted to shorten the speech. So you learned about cutaways. You learned about you know uh, cutaways that were relevant. In other words, you couldn't show the audience drinking cups of coffee. You had to show the audience concentrating. So you picked your moments. So um, it, that taught me a hell of a lot about editing and putting scenes together. And then I was uh, the other thing that BBC Television did was they used to shoot outdoor scenes for live television plays because the TV cameras never went out of the studio. They were too big, too clumsy, and they needed a very special electrical supply, three-phase electricity supply. 
So obviously a battery-driven camera was the ideal thing to go uh, on the moors and shoot horses galloping past. So we used to do a lot of that. <coughs> Excuse me. We used to do a lot of that, which is very much filmic, very much feature-like. Yeah. And then after 12 years of being at the BBC, you know, somebody saw a, uh, an all-filmed play I'd done, which uh, had a documentary approach, and they said, look, we've got this feature film that we want to shoot, and uh, we want to do it in a documentary style, and uh, we haven't yet found a cameraman that, that, that A, wants to do it, or B, uh, has that experience. So would you be interested? Well, what was I going to say? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it, I had to think about giving my job up at the BBC, but I said, well, yeah. So I went to meet them, and... Um, as you know, as luck would have it, the film actually happened because the the producer of it told me uh, halfway through the shoot. He said, um, "By the way, you didn't know, but we didn't get the money until two days before the first day of shooting." He said, "We could have actually cancelled the whole thing." So I was lucky, you know. It all came about, and we made this movie, and it was the uh, official British entry at the Cannes Film Festival in 1977. That was my first feature film. So the BBC Black, was Black tremendously Joy? influential. Black Joy, correct. Yeah, yeah. So it was well, tremendous. The BBC was tremendously influential in me getting to that place, you know. Well, and it sounds like it taught you, I mean, some some key skills as you've just told me, but but also. Well, it taught me a, everything a, because uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, the, 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 all the cameramen when I joined were ex feature film people. A lot of them were when they when the BBC bought Ealing Film Studios in 1953, I think it was, or 1954, maybe later. They bought the Ealing Film Studios, and they bought a lot of the equipment, and they bought, um, and they took on some of the impl people that were employed there. So people that were clapper loaders or focus pullers got taken on as cameramen. So a lot of people I worked with had actually worked in feature films. So uh, you could learn a lot from them. They could tell you all sorts of tricks and ways to do things and... Uh, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a fascinating collection of people, which you don't find in a freelance world because you're all individual and you're all solo. Uh, and at the BBC, you know, the, we were all together in this organisation, and there was a tea room, a canteen, where if you didn't have a job that particular day, there might be one day when you weren't, they couldn't find something for you. And you'd be sitting in the canteen with six other guys, and we'd all swap stories and tell stories about this, that, and the other. Or and if you saw something on TV by one of the guys, you liked it. Then you went in the next day and tried to find him and said, you, yeah, that shot you did. So I said, how did you do that? It was really good. So it was, it was a wonderful place um, to swap ideas and just learn about the business. I want to, I want to tell you that just this past week we were um... – Talking, uh, talking about a series of films, and 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 the Long Good Friday came up, and uh -huh. we we are all so crazy about that movie. Uh, it's one of our top favorites from that era. Um, well, it, it is. Was, I've it, just done the restoration of it on the Blu-ray, which is coming oh out in March, I think. Yeah. Wow. Well, and you know, uh, they're also going to re-release the. Uh, they've made a DCP of it, and I think they're going to re-release it in the cinemas in March. I don't know how or when or you know, whether it be you know nationwide or what, but we've just done a restoration of it. So. Well, it was on a it was on a list that we were reviewing. It was a list of the top uh, twenty neo noir films, uh, and it was it was at number one. And I was curious yes. in your in your preparations for that film, were you were you referencing and thinking about the the noir genre? No, not really. I mean, it's, an, it's a genre that I like. I like thrillers as, um, uh, because I think you get more chance and opportunity to do interesting camera work. Um, and if you look back over most of my career, a lot of what I've done has been uh, thriller-type things. Even James Bond films are sort of thrillers, basically. Um, and uh, no, as someone, you know, I'm echoing what a, uh, another friend of mine who was the um, first AD on Star Wars and uh, in 1973, whenever it was, 77, and, and I said, did you realize you, you were making Star Wars, you know, the Star Wars when you were doing it? And he said, well, no, not really. It was just another job. And the interesting thing about Long Good Friday was, um, to me, it was, it, I knew the director very well. He was the director who directed the film that got me the 
Black Joy. He mm. directed this thing called Elephant's Graveyard. And it was that film that, that, that made the director of Black Joy ring me up and say, you know, would you like to do my feature film? And that was John McKenzie. He was the one who directed um, Long Good Friday. And so to me, it was sort of repeat business in a sense, is that there were directors that whatever they said they wanted to do, I was going to do it. So, uh, you know, John rang me up and said, we've got this film. And originally it was going to be for television. And the more we thought about it, the more we dug into it, the more we realized that it would be better suited to cinema. But we didn't have the official permission to do that. So we actually shot it in uh, two formats. We shot it basically in 185, but we also shot with an open gate so that we had a 4x3 version, should it end up on TV. And um, but of course, you know, the, you know, the history of it. So in the end of the day, um, what happened was we finished the film and the guy who, who financed it was a guy called Lord Grade. Um, and uh, he had a company called ITC Entertainment, which is a television company. And uh, he was shocked that he'd made a film about the IRA, basically. And he said to his guys, well, you know, I want you to get rid of it. I don't want to know anything about this, you know. He never saw it even. Um, he, was, he had a habit of never seeing anything. He just used to write checks and say, tell me what your film's about. Okay, here's a check. And um, so he didn't want to know. But he, was a bit, he was scared, I suppose, that you know, he might drum up some sort of retaliation from in the Irish Republican Army. And um, so he then sold it to Handmade Films. And it was Handmade that finally released it. And it was a, we were championed by a film critic called um, Barry Norman, who ran a television show in Britain on BBC television. And uh, he championed the film. And up until then, it was, it was thought to be unlikely it would ever be seen by anybody. And, to, and with his championing of it and also Handmade Films' his purchasing of it, it actually gave it a kick up the arse, if you like, to get it onto the screen. And uh, it became very successful because of it. And there's now quite a cult film, as you know. Very much so. And it's grown in stature as the years have gone by. But but did did it strike a – are you saying that it struck a chord uh, immediately upon release? Could could you sense that? Well, no, you know, and the thing is you never know. You make these films to the best of your ability every time. You put your heart and soul into films and – you know, and you're really desperate for it to be successful. So every film, as it opens, you're desperate to be successful. But I think The Long Good Friday was a slow burn in that sense. <clears throat> but I think a lot of critics got behind it, and that sort of gave it a lot more cachet. But I think it's grown as well over time. Um, I'm not, I can't remember when it first opened what business it did. But, um, you know, every film you make, you want it to be a big hit, you know, and you're waiting for those... Uh, well, over here you get the opening weekend figures. Well, we didn't get those in Britain. So <laughs> you're waiting for the director to ring up and say, oh, it's doing very well. So, 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 blah, 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 blah. Um, but as far as I can remember, it wasn't like a huge, great fanfare and out it came. I think it was a slow, slow burn. It, it gradually gained in stature as it went along. Well, there have been a f there have been a few directors that you've worked with regularly, uh, Mr. McKinsey for one, and and, and Mr. Yes. Campbell for another. Uh, yeah. what, what do you find that when you go back and and kind of have repeat collaborations, that you're constantly searching for ways to uh, push yourselves further from the last collaboration you did together? Um. Yeah, I mean. It, it, in a sense, yes. I mean, I think that every time, well, I can't speak for Mr. Campbell, but every time I get a movie, I'm determined to make it different than the one before or, or improve on what I did the one before. Um, I think that's never. if you don't do that, you might as well give up doing the job. Um, it, it, you know, it's like if you think of a chef, you know, who creates a dish <clears throat> and then he wants to create something better or another one. And I think that's how we work in films is – is that uh, no film is ever the perfect example of good filmmaking. You always see it afterwards and think, I think I could have done that better, or I think next time I do that, I think I'll do this. Um, but what gets easier when you go back to the same director, uh, you know, with Mackenzie or Campbell, is that you know each other so well. Um, whereas when you work with a new director, you spend the first three weeks of any movie trying to find out where he's coming from, and he's trying to find out where you're coming from. 
Well, with with people that know you well, you don't have to do that. They, you know, it's all they know you so well that you just walk straight in. <clears throat> I mean, the great thing about me and Martin was that you know he'd ring up and say, "Well, we're on again. We've got another one starting on March the third or whatever it is. Uh, I'll send you the script." And that was it. You know, with anybody new, you have to the, the, your name goes on a list. They have to see if they think you're the right person for the job. You have to read the script and see if you want to do it. And then you go and meet them, and you have to try and suss them out and see what sort of person they are and whether they're going to like what you do. Or uh, so it becomes a much bigger deal in that sense. And with repeat business, you don't have to to live through that. You can you know what you're going to get if you like, and uh, you know. And then you meet you meet up and you discuss. Uh, ways of doing things and uh, you know um, do you want to do this differently do you want to do something like that do you want to do something like that <clears throat> or we talk over ideas about the best way of doing something um, you know as you would with any any director you just talk over the whole concept of it yeah. but it's one, one thing that, do you know Freddie Francis cameraman <laughs> yes you yes him? yes sir who shot Elephant Man and all that absolutely he said that he talked about meeting Martin Scorsese to do Cape Fear and he said, I knocked at his door, and uh, and, he's, and he's, he said, that, you know, are you interested in Cape Fear? I said, yeah. He said, did you see the original? And Freddie said, yeah, I did. He said, did, what did you like about it? Did you like it? And uh, Freddie Francis said, well, I didn't, I didn't know much about it, actually. I, didn't, I can't remember much about it, but I liked the photography. And Scorsese said, good. And then said to Freddie... Now you've been you've worked a lot with uh, Michael Powell, haven't you? He said, "Tell me about Michael Powell." And he said, "And I spent the next two or three hours discussing my relationship with Michael Powell, and we didn't even talk about Cape Fear." And he said, "We never talked about it right up until the end of the shoot." He said, "Because what you do is you understand where each of you are coming from, and you find the common ground, and you don't actually need to say very much. I mean, you might say, All right, I'd like a wider shot or a closer shot,' but..." Basically, you don't need to say it. I mean, there are some directors who will tell you even the lens size, uh, that reputedly what Hitchcock used to do. But there are other directors who don't want to know the lens size, just say, get me a nice close-up. Or and other directors who will get halfway between the two. Um, so when you meet a director, you need to suss them out and see what it is they need from you. And uh, when it's Mackenzie or Campbell, you know what you're getting and they know what they're getting. And they trust you with certain things. And Martin Campbell never, never criticised, or uh, I, I would like to say, never noticed my lighting on a scene until it was at Rush's. That's when he noticed it. He didn't actually see it while we were doing it. So in a sense, I was left by myself, which was great for me because then, if I wanted to experiment with something, I could do it silently without saying, uh, "By the way, I'm going to try and do this in this shot, and I hope you like it," which is an awful thing to have to say to a director. I would just do it. And uh, trust my instincts if, you know, that it was going to be something he'd like. And, you know, nine times out of ten it was. I think it's rare that he ever turned around to me and said, I didn't like that. Or why was it so dark or why was it so bright? We never got that, you know. It is so, uh, speaking of experimentation, it is so kind of serendipitous that you mentioned uh, Freddie Francis and, and Scorsese's Cape Fear. Because uh, a couple of years ago I was interviewing Robert Richardson. And he said that he had first met Scorsese for Cape Fear, but Scorsese yep. had already chosen Freddie. So, uh, and I was thinking about Cape Fear earlier today, and I was I was thinking this is a claustrophobic thriller, and it's shot in in widescreen, which is a very unusual choice for that particular yep. type of genre. Do do you kind of relish the opportunity to to experiment with with the une, unexpected? When you when you craft well, you get film. the unexpected whether you want it or not. I mean, the great thing about murky movies is that there's always an unexpected moment, and uh, you rejoice in those things, particularly if it's very much what you needed. I mean, weather. I mean, who can say what the weather's going to be unless you shoot in California, <clears throat> which nobody wants to do these days. Uh, you know, you can go on location and say, you know what, a cloudy day will be perfect for the scene, and you get there and the sun's burning down on you. So now you've got to think of another way of doing what you were going to do. So to me, that's the most uh, uh, the unexpected thing that I regret coming across is weather, um, because y you can plan all sorts of things. And the weather's not on your side. Um, it can be hell sometimes to actually get 
the mood and the feeling into the scene. You have to use all your expertise and your your uh, experience uh, to do that and say, well, now how can I do this to, to, to make it look good? I did a picture for TV um, while I was at BBC called Spend, 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 which was um, a classic story of a woman who won the football pools, or what you would say over here, I suppose, is the lottery, but um, won a huge amount of money and basically frittered the whole lot away. And she was quite a character, and uh, they'd written a script about her. And the first part of her life, she, she, her father worked in the coal mine, and uh, they had no money, and they had a tiny little house, and uh, you know, which was uh, not exactly well decorated, not 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 great furniture or rest of it. So I made up my mind that the first part of this film, we should shoot with. Uh, as much cloud as we could get, we should get some rain going, and all of those things um, to get the mood right. And the director said, great idea, great idea. When we got to shoot the film, it was the rare time in England where there, there was a, a heat wave, and the skies were clear blue for six weeks solid. So I had to now do it another way altogether. Um, and that that's what I call by the unexpected. So then you, the, you really are up against it now, trying to recreate what was in your head using now a completely different set of, of, of tools, different paints, if you like. Um, yeah. But uh, you, I think you can't, getting back to your question, I don't think you can really, you've got to be careful that you don't step outside of what the film is about. You've got to understand what the film is about. And it, it, particularly in terms of performance by an actor, I mean, whatever you say, people go to the cinema to see the actors. They don't go to see, they go to see a car crashing up a wall and bursting into flames, but they want to know why and who was in it. So it's important when you make movies that you understand that the characters are as just as important as the photography is. And in fact, my contention has always been that people don't really notice the photography or they shouldn't notice the photography. Uh, they should follow the story. And the photography should serve the story. So if someone's scared, then obviously you try to make it dark, you know, uh, and so on and so on and so on. I mean, that's an obvious choice. But, you know, if someone's alone, you make wider angle shots. You make the shot wider and you make him appear to be with nobody else sitting around him or uh, stuff like that. If they're frustrated, um, you keep it on long lenses maybe and you stack them up with other people on the street and make it look more crowded than it is. You do those sorts of things. But people do go to see performance and uh, by the actor and therefore in my book i think it's important that you photograph the actors and give them uh, a comfortable set in which to work um you don't give them necessarily you don't give them tough positions on the floor to hit during their performance or you don't give them lights that are too bright that dazzle them or things like that um I mean, it sounds simple, but it, you know, it means more complicated than that. But well, I'm, I'm so on. glad that you actually brought that topic up in terms of, of in terms of style serving story, because I mean, uh, so many films t today they look very pristine. I mean, they're they're beautiful, visually arresting pieces, but um, sometimes I find that they they're so consumed with style that they end up sabotaging the story. And I'm afraid to say this, you know, this is the problem that cinematographers are dealing with in terms of digital technology, is that anyone now can pick up a camera and get an image. So, you know, you've got producers out there who don't see the value of an, of an experienced, trained cameraman because uh, they say, well, they'll watch it. If, if, if they like, if it's Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie arguing, they'll watch it. And, uh, uh, and that that we're dealing with that now, that the cameraman, I think, is, is, is losing respect because of this way that anyone can make a film now. And it annoys me that you get kids coming into the business who want to be in the business. No, no problem with that. You go in the, you know, if you want to be here and you can put up with it, uh, you can put up with rejection and you can be dedicated and, and, and get into the business that way. Uh, you know, they, they make a website, they make these little short films in their back garden, uh, for want of a better expression, and they put them on a website and they put their name up and under their name, they put director of photography. And the thing is, you're not a director of photography until you are directing the photography, which means more than one camera and a lot more besides. 
which is like makeup, costume, uh, 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 choosing locations, set design, helping with the set design, choosing colors for hair, you know, looking at makeup on people, see if it works. And all that That's director of photography. And, but now people think that just by, you know, you can make a film with your iPhone, you know, uh, but is that filmmaking? And I don't think it is. But the tragedy is, is that it's becoming the norm that people can just literally pick up a camera and the producers are saying, why are we paying this camera? That cameraman you mentioned earlier, um, you know, is, gets a hell of a lot of money per week. Well, you know, some producers might turn around and say, why do we need to pay him that much? Surely there are other cameramen who can do just as good a job. Um, whereas in the past, it was a skill it's a skill which I have learned over the years, and I, I have now, um, of handling film stock and developer and how to get, how to, you know, they, you went out on the set. Nobody knew what you'd done until the next day when the dailies came in. No one knew exactly what it was you'd done, and you hoped you would surprise them and delight them. Well, that day is gone now because it's all there on set. People are standing around your monitor watching what's going on, and they've now seen it all. So there's no surprise element. There's no, there's no magician's thing. So uh, that's, I think, where we're losing some of our cachet, if you like. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, let me get back to asking you about a couple of your projects. Yes. You're so generous with your time with me, so thank you so much. Um, it's just, you, you brought up Bond. So you shot two terrific Bond movies. You shot Goldeneye. And you yeah. shot Casino Royale. So I want to know about yeah. the the different approach because obviously in Casino Royale they were looking to go back to this kind of harder edged bond. So how did that yeah. translate into a different approach for you? It was uh, I'm very much involved in, or I like to be very much involved in the film making, not just the photography of it. Um, I, it's boring for me just to say, well, why don't we light this in a certain way or why don't we put this filter on? I'm not only interested in that. I want to, you know, I want to get into the cutting and the cam way to use the camera uh, and all of those elements. And, uh, you know, and Martin and I, of course, we'd known each other for eight other movies prior to that. We had a lot of experience with action. Uh, we had, with Golden Eye, we had a lot of experience with James Bond. And we thought that, you know that it needs to have a rougher edge and by doing it a rougher edge it, it would sometimes and it's difficult to say pinpoint a sequence and say take a look at this scene but a rougher edge sometimes is the way the camera maneuvers itself you know that it pan if it pans very fast rather than very slowly that itself is a decision that, that creates a feeling of unsettlement uh, uh, if the camera suddenly moves in on someone or somebody moves away from somebody or it's handheld or it's steady cam or it's any of those things um, if used in the right way they can actually create they can add to the emotion of the scene and certainly with the opening sequence which was in black and white which was an idea we came up with i don't know who actually came up with that idea but it was to take bond back to when he wasn't bond so we wanted to make it look like a period, and we, we talked about it. And, and I said, well, the scene's in somebody's office, so it's going to be difficult, and a toilet, of course, but it's going to be difficult to create, you know, I mean, a toilet in 1970 is going to look exactly the same as a toilet in two, year 2000. So, you know, you can't use the set to tell the period. So what we decided was we'd shoot it in black and white. And uh, then I decided to uh, push the toilet sequence so it was grainier and more contrasty um, that in itself gave it an edge gave it much more of an edge you felt you know when you're watching that scene the graininess actually makes you sort of nervous slightly I mean for want of a better word it makes you slightly on your toes because you feel you feel slightly unsettled by it so it's using techniques such as that the, the, but uh, you know um, uh, but once it gets going I mean it's, you know, there's a certain amount of inevitability with car chases and uh, like the fight down the stairs. You know, we decided that this should be v very um, uh, physical and uh, not balletic and it shouldn't be full of, you know, crazy stunts. It should be look, it should look quite nasty and uh, sort of thing, the fight you might get into in a pub on a Saturday night. So we decided we'd do all of that handheld. Um, uh, which is very common now for people to do that. But up until then, the camera wasn't handheld until it goes into that stairwell. So you save that up. I think you save those things up. 
what I find distressing with a lot of films now is they take a technique like handheld and they put it all the way through the entire movie. So it loses its uh, uh, um, uh, effect. Same with close-ups. You know, if you have a huge close-up within the first five minutes of a film, you've used your greatest piece of drama too soon, in my opinion. You should save those things up for the, for the important moments. Looking over your resume, I'm also struck by a, a title like Ruby, uh, ah, which is glad cool. you picked on that. Most of Ruby certainly is all is what we call faction. You know, it's a script written on the basis of what may have taken place. Mm-hmm. None of none of what happens to Ruby is actually documented on film. Mm-hmm. None of what took place in that film. The only thing that's documented is the actual assassination, uh, which is well documented. Uh, well, it's not that well documented actually, because in those days. Um, I mean, there were no television cameras when, where it took place. It was all people with film cameras that actually captured it. Uh, and Zap Ruder and his 8mm, people like that, actually captured the event. Um, and still photographs were captured the event. So there weren't any sort of... The television cameras would run out at that point. Um, so you, you have to take on board the atmosphere of the piece. And, uh, and I think it's very exciting to try and create the illusion of something that actually took place. Um, if you've got footage, then you're home and dry because you've got something to actually look at. If you haven't got footage, then I find it's more interesting because you're going to say to yourself, now what would it have looked like in those days? What would have been the, what sort of lights did the cameraman have? I mean, like the the last scene where Ruby goes down to uh, kill Oswald. I mean, all we have from that is a television camera footage of him being taken out and shot. Well, the actual shooting uh, it's never been shown. It's always been cut out. Uh, so no one's ever seen it. So we then, we t- I took on board what the, th- the scene looked like, which was these huge floodlights, which were on the back door of the police station, and all these people, uh, reporters standing around. And I used that as the basis of the scene. And the rest of it, you just create yourself. Um, I mean, I made his shadow go down the wall. I mean, he, he's like in silhouette, and he comes into the tunnel. And it's just his silhouette, him and his uh, shadow going down the wall. Um, so I use things like that to create that feeling of um, impending doom, basically. Because people may actually, you know, if they, if they know the story, they more or less know what's going to happen next. So my idea is to try and show it with uh, an artistic approach that takes you, not by surprise, but makes you look at it again and not actually, you know... Um, see it as a piece of newsreel footage but see it as a piece of drama well was that i'm Uh, I'm wondering if 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 the tone of that set was unique in that this touched upon a part of history that was seismic i mean uh, did did did, did it feel like a different kind of feeling of responsibility on that set no not really i mean I mean, you know, my responsibility is to the story and to the drama. I mean, that we shot that actually at the actual place it took place. That was Dallas Police Station. That was where Oswald was shot. And we got permission to actually shoot it in the place it took place. So um, that gives you a lift anyway, because you think, right, now I've got everything I need here, because this is how it actually looked like, you know. So now I can work with that, what was actually here at the time. Um, but no, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it gets in the way at all. Um, no, I, that's what I can think of saying. <laughs> but no. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to also ask you about working in in comedy, uh, because I'm sure uh, a, a, a lot of different uh, professions in the comedy filmmaking world, whether it be composing or or the photography or what have you. There might be a danger of uh, playing up the laughs or stepping on the laughs, or is that a consideration for you? All of the above, yeah. But of course, that's not really my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the director to stage the scene that allows the breathing space for possible laughter or lack of. Um, I mean, all we can do, I mean, I always think if I laugh on set, it may, I may not laugh in the theater. And uh, it's very interesting how that goes. I remember I did a picture with um, Robin Williams called Bicentennial Man. 
and uh, there's a scene where he gets thrown out the bedroom window and he turns up in the hallway and uh, at the end of the scene he walks away back to the kitchen and uh, instead of going into the kitchen door walks into a wall well at the time I did it uh, I remember I couldn't stop laughing after we'd shot it I had to walk off the set and stuff sock in my mouth because I was I was in danger of ruining the take <laughs> because it just I found it incredibly funny in the film it's not to me it's not funny at all and I tried to analyze what was wrong with it and what was wrong with it was the editor cut the reaction way too short so he didn't have time to take in the gag so when he hits the wall you don't know he's hit a wall you just think he's hit something but then the next scene starts immediately and i think the important thing about about comedy is space for people to laugh and to to take on the joke and i did a, a consultancy on a cartoon uh, animated film cloudy with a chance of meatballs too uh I was a visual consultant on that, and uh, I used to talk to these guys, and they used to show me their storyboards and their cuts and things. And I said, "Look, you know, whatever you do, leave space for the humour to come through." You know, the, and I said, "If you're in doubt how it should be, watch Laurel and Hardy, because every time something goes wrong with Laurel and Hardy, they don't cut to a new scene; they hold it while the two boys react to each other and look at each other, and then Oliver may go." Mm -hmm. Mm, or whatever, but that's you need that breathing space. Otherwise, you know, you look at comedians, stand-up comedians. You know, if they say they tell you a gag, they pretend to start the next sentence, but they cut themselves short because they know you're going to want to laugh. So they will say, "Well, I tell you what, my mother-in-law, she went out and got three pairs of socks." Now I'll tell you something else, and then everybody laughs, and he waits for it to go down. He says, "Anyway," and then he goes on to a completely different subject. It's just <laughs> part of timing, isn't it?